Thank you, Phil, and thank you, Charlie, for the invitation. This has been a wonderful conference, and thank you, everyone, for, for sticking around. So I will talk about uh, some recent work uh, um, that turns out to be uh, related to uh, a lot of the talks here, but that uh, was motivated by a problem in image processing. So I'll just go ahead and state one of the main results up front. Uh, we have one of the sort of standard uh, Sobolev or Poincaré inequalities for functions of bounded variation on the unit square uh, reads like this. You have a function, or um, this is that Sobolev inequality restricted to uh, piecewise constant functions, so it's a discrete version. Uh, for a function that's a n by n array of real numbers, which is mean zero, the um, L2 norm of, of the function can be bounded by the total variation. And uh, in this talk, by total variation, I just mean the sum of absolute uh, horizontal and vertical discrete differences. So this is a, a standard total of inequality. And in this talk, um, one of the inequalities we'll, we'll uh, actually talk about and prove is that with very high probability, uh, a much stronger result holds if your, your n by n uh, signal lies in the null space of a sort of random matrix. So with high probability, um, for all images uh, signals in R n by n um, that are in the null space of an m by n squared random Gaussian matrix, the L2 norm can be bounded up to some absolute constant that depends on nothing, so we don't worry about that. Um, by the total variation divided by the square root of m, where m is the number of random constraints that, the, um, that are satisfied, and then times um, a logarithmic factor in the ambient dimension. Okay? So in particular, um, if the number of random linear constraints uh, exceeds essentially um, log n to the cubed power, then this gives a, a stronger inequality than the standard. Okay. Note that uh, being zero mean is one um, linear constraint. So now we have m random type linear constraints. Okay, and all of this is joint work with uh, my colleague Deanna Needell at Claremont McKenna College. And I'm thankful for research uh, sponsors that help support this work. So I want to first talk about the motivation for studying these problems in the first place that I had from image processing. And then in the second part of the talk, I'll, I'll um, give a sort of gentle uh, proof of, of the result. So hopefully uh, you guys can see um, the, the here. Images, discrete images, those images that we care about in real life are compressible in discrete gradient. So in the discrete world, we might have an image that consists of 512 by 512 pixels. Um, but if we look at the discrete gradient of the image, if we take, instead of plotting each pixel, we plot the sum of the horizontal, the absolute um, horizontal plus vertical uh, discrete differences, then we see that we only have a lot of um, interesting things happen along edges of the image. And the edges of the image um, are on some singular set, lower dimensional set. Okay, so this might be 512 by 512, but in some sense it's much, much lower dimensional. Um, so to be more specific, we'll define the discrete directional derivatives of an image in Rn by n as just being the horizontal um, difference between uh, adjacent pixel values and the discrete difference between adjacent pixel values. Note that I'm not dividing by any sort of I'm not normalizing by n here, so I'm talking about absolute uh, differences. Um, and then the discrete gradient operator is just the concatenation of the two. Um, images, natural images, are also compressible in wavelet bases, which are related to the fact that they're compressible in gradient, but not equivalent. And we'll try to clarify this relationship a little more later. So for instance, I have this boat image. And I look at its orthonormal uh, discrete bivariate Haar wavelet transform. And these are the coefficients. Uh, there it is. Uh, the coefficients of the image. Um, this is an orthonormal transform, so the sum of the squares 
of the, of the uh, entries in the transform domain is equal to the sum of the squares of the, the pixel values. And, and then I just set to zero all but the largest 10% of, of the wavelet coefficients and invert uh, to get the image on the very left-hand side. Um, and we see that uh, it's hard to tell the difference between this picture on the left-hand side, which is, consists of only the using 10% of the uh, wavelet coefficients. Um, and that is because images are, are compressible in wavelet bases. So uh, the bivariate Haar wavelet transform uh, just consists of taking inner products of the image with essentially horizontal, discrete, and diagonal, um, horizontal, horizontal, vertical, and diagonal discrete differences across dyadic scales. And so it's, it's, you see the relation to the discrete gradient at the, the smallest dyadic scale, but because it's across all dyadic scales, this transform is, can be made orthonormal. Okay, so I'll just talk about, whenever I talk about LP norms, I'm just talking about the entry-wise LP norms on my, my image. Um, I'll say that an image or an element of Rn by n is S sparse if um, only at most S of its entries are non-zero. Okay, and the best S sparse approximation is that image formed by zeroing out all except the largest magnitude, the S largest magnitude entries of the image. So in particular, if U is S sparse, then its best S sparse approximation error is zero. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is the best S sparse approximation error. And so this time when I've been saying images are compressible, um, more formally what that means is that the best S sparse approximation error to the gradient of the image uh, decays quickly as S increases. And the best S sparse approximation error um, in the wavelet domain also decays quickly as S increases. Okay, and, and this fact um, underlies, uh, um, morally speaking, uh, a lot of the JPEG compression algorithms and other algorithms that allows you to store lots of pictures on your computers efficiently. Okay, so the compressed sensing paradigm uh, just tries to answer the question of if, if natural images, like other, lots of other high-dimensional signals that we encounter in everyday life, are so compressible in, in these bases that we know, so they're nearly low-dimensional, do we really need to first store every single pixel value of the image on our computer um, if we're just going to go back and then set to zero all but so many of them in some domain? Um, can we get away with just taking a, a fewer, it's my English, a fewer number of more general linear measurements in the first place of the image? So sometimes this is just, um, this can just be a question of transferring the cost from the acquisition stage to the reconstruction stage. Uh, as Charlie was talking about, there, um, you know, you can save a lot of cost if instead of storing n by n pixels, um, I were to just store, say, 20 um, um, linear measurements of the image. Um, but then how to reconstruct the image or approximate it from those 20 measurements, that's a different story. In other situations, um, such as in medical imaging, we don't have the choice of reading the, the image pixel by pixel, but we are constrained to acquiring with certain types of measurements, like in magnetic resonance imaging. Um, we cannot actually take pixel values of the, the underlying image of the brain that we want without killing someone. Um, unfortunately, we can only take ro rotating magnetic field measurements, which can be well approximated by two-dimensional discrete Fourier transform measurements. So that's the simplification I'm, I'm making. So in magnetic resonant, resonance imaging, we want to acquire an n by n image, x, but we can only acquire it through um, evaluations of the 2D discrete Fourier transform, so of this form. And there is interest 
to reduce the number of such linear measurements that we take because measurements in MRI um, more or less amount to a certain fixed amount of time that it takes to be in the MRI. So reduced number of measurements means re reduced time in the MRI scan, which can be um, advantageous for children who don't like to stay still or when we're trying to uh, take MRI of things that are moving, like a heartbeat, and we don't have a lot of time to sit there and, and acquire something that's moving. So given an image that is in the abstract problem, given something that is exactly S sparse in gradient, say, where S is much smaller than the ambient dimension, how many linear measurements can we get away? How, how small can we make this number? Um, how, how few measurements can we get away with taking? And what types of measurements um, would they be, the ones that we can get away with? Okay. So more generally, what we're asking is if we have a discrete signal of interest, now just F. A, a, a signal in RD, which has at most S non-zero entries, but we don't know which of the entries are non-zero. Okay? We just know that this guy only has S non-zero entries somewhere in here. Um, we have a measurement operator that's underdetermined. Um, we only have our measurement matrix has only M rows, and we're allowed to measure AF equals Y. So we have Y. So from Y and knowledge of this uh, measurement matrix, can we use the sparsity to use knowledge of the sparsity to exactly recover uh, the S sparse function F from Y? Okay. And if so, for what types of measurement matrices A? Because clearly if this were just a subset of the rows from the identity matrix, we would be screwed. Okay. So a really uh, nice and elegant sufficient condition on the types of measurement matrices that, that can be used to, um, for sparse recovery is uh, called the restricted isometry property. And the restricted isometry property uh, for an underdetermined matrix, the restricted isometry property of order S, says that the matrix is up to a factor of one plus or minus one fourth, say, uh, an isometry restricted to the set of S sparse vectors. So this is a very, this is a union of subspaces, this, um, this set. Okay, so another way of thinking about this is if you have your measurement matrix, and you look at any subset of S columns from the matrix, any subset of S columns, then you get a matrix um, that's almost an isometry. Okay. And so um, it's intuitive, or it makes sense that this implies that essentially this problem becomes invertible when we restrict to S sparse vectors. Not only invertible, actually, but stably so, um, because, because, because of the, the almost isometry. And this is exactly what this property implies, implies that we can make some sense of how this sparse recovery problem is uh, stably invertible. So which, which matrices satisfy this property? Um, Gaussian or Bernoulli measurement matrices satisfy this restricted isometry property when the number of rows in the matrix is essentially like the sparsity level S times um, log D, where D is the, the ambient dimension. Okay, and this is, this is a lower bound. Um, um, one could, this, or this achieves the optimal, the optimal rate, these random matrices. So I really mean we have a matrix and each entry is an independent copy of a variable that's one with probability one half, minus one half, and then properly normalized. Um, there are no known deterministic constructions of, of matrices that satisfy this property up to this optimal order or any order where we allow for a few extra log factors. 
if we want to scale linearly in the sparsity level, there are no known deterministic constructions. Um, it's a very hard problem. Um, if we allow for a few extra logarithmic factors in the dimension, then we can take more, we can um, construct more sort of interesting types of restricted isometry property matrices. Um, for instance, by taking m rows randomly from the n by n discrete Fourier matrix. So this is nice because discrete Fourier matrices have fast matrix vector multiplies. And so um, that means that we can acquire and reconstruct much more quickly. So this is called sort of structured random right, RAP matrices. And I'll get, I'll get back to that. Okay. So a theorem is that if we observe y equal AF, and A satisfies the restricted isometry property of order S, and F hat is the vector of minimal L1 norm agreeing with the measurements Y. So it's the vector among the affine space, affine subspace of, of vectors that um, equal Y. Um, then if the original underlying vector F is S sparse, then we get exact reconstruction. Um, and if F is approximately S sparse, which is more realistic um, in, in practice, then we, this convex optimization program will approximately reconstruct F. And to be more precise by what I mean by approximately, I mean that the um, error in the L1 norm between the original and the reconstructed vector is proportional to the best S-term approximation error of the vector in the L1 norm, and the error taken in respect to the L2 norm is proportional to this best S-term approximation error divided by squared of S. And these, these rates are essentially um, optimal if our matrices are Gaussian random matrices. And um, a, way, a, a way I like to think about this is that this error rate, this best S term approximation error, this is an oracle error rate. If I knew beforehand where the locations of the S leading coefficients were, and I picked them out to approximate my function by some S sparse vector, then this would be the best error I could get. And this says that if we allow for additional um, log n measurements, so S log N, then the convex program will automatically recover an approximation up to that error. Okay. And essentially by change of basis, we get a similar result when our image is not sparse in the canonical domain, but has a sparse representation um, in an, a known orthonormal basis B, which say B could be the Haar wavelet uh, transform, like we talked about earlier, then it reduces to just studying the restricted isometry properties of the composite matrix, measurement matrix A, composed with the inverse or transpose of the sparsity basis. Okay, we get the same results. So uh, for imaging applications, um, a, a method, oh, say, for imaging applications, it makes sense to um, consider instead, if our model is that our, our image is sparse and gradient, okay, then it makes sense to instead um, reconstruct the image from compressed measurements as the image of minimal uh, total variation. Okay. Because total variation, remember, is just the L1 norm of the gradient, and that is where we're assuming that our image is sparse. Okay. So... Um, for imaging applications, we, we consider total variation minimization. Um, pretty immediate guarantees using the, the results I just showed you um, from compressed sensing give um, error rates um, or error guarantees on the gradient between the, the gradients of the reconstructed and the original image. Okay? Um, but... They don't say anything about the error in the pixel domain. Because now the gradient operator 
is not orthonormal, and to invert it, um, this inverting it incurs additional factors of, of the ambient dimension n here. So that's that's bad. So what we can say immediately from these error rates and the standard discrete Sobolev inequality that I showed you at the very top of the first page is so the Sobolev inequality, um, the standard Sobolev inequality for uh, discrete images and these error rates gives immediately that we get um, an error rate proportional to the best S-term approximation of the gradient. And the question is, can we do better by also using the information that we know that this, this error image lies in the null space of this very nicely behaved matrix? Okay. So does, does that extra information give us enough constraints that we can do better than this. And this was the motivation for me to study Sobolev inequalities for images in the null space of random matrices. And in fact, with that result, um, we can do better by a factor of 1 over square root of s. Um, so now I'm just back to the original slide, pretty much, where the theorem that I have is for all images in the null space of a matrix, which when composed with the bivariate Haar wavelet transform, um, becomes a matrix which has the restricted isometry property of 2s, of order 2s, then um, the image uh, satisfies this um, strengthened Sobolev inequality. Um, something that might be intuitive um, to think of this as more something concrete rather than the strange, really bizarre abstract um, object is that constant functions cannot possibly be in the null space of this matrix because a constant function has a one sparse representation in the Haar wavelet basis and um, therefore it's um, its norm would be preserved um, uh, under, this, under this map. And so, therefore, it is not mapped to zero. And so that makes sense. So it's, it's hinging the, the images around uh, the origin as, as should happen for Sobolev inequality. And what this gives for total variation minimization is that we can then use the Sobolev inequality um, to, to get um, um, this error rate uh, for total variation minimization with, for example, um, Gaussian random measurements. Because a, random, um, a Gaussian ma random matrix is invariant by an um, orthonormal transform, therefore, um, Therefore, we can do that. OK. So more concretely, we can apply results for, that are known for restricted isometry property matrices, and then come up with uh, this corollary that I stated up front. So this is nothing new. Um, a little more um, technically, or perhaps less directly, we can also come up, it also implies a corollary for uh, Sobolev inequality for images in the null space of matrices corresponding to Fourier constraints. So up here, this, if we think of this as Fourier space, frequency space, so we have here um, bet frequencies between minus n over 2 and n over 2, and then we have frequencies here between n over 2 and minus n over 2. And so then I have my two-dimensional discrete Fourier matrix, and I subsample this matrix according to this weighted distribution. So I subsample a frequency pair K1, K2 from the frequencies, the, the 2D Fourier frequencies. I sample a frequency proportional to one 
essentially proportional to 1 over its uh, Euclidean distance from the origin squared. Um, this is a visualization of the distribution here. So lower frequencies are sampled with higher probability. So, so if I sample a set of m frequencies um, from this distribution, then with high probability, um, I will have a set of m constraints such that for all images um, whose uh, 2D discrete Fourier transform vanishes on these frequencies, um, we have a similar uh, discrete Sobolev inequality up to a few extra factors of log n. Okay. Again, um, with probability one, uh, well, not probability one, but probability essentially one, um, the, um, the constant uh, function or the, the zeroth frequency will be selected here. And so, in particular, this, these images will be mean zero, as in the mean zero plus having zero higher order modes, essentially. But interestingly, this result doesn't hold if we just set sort of the, the lowest m frequencies equal to zero. Um, so some amount of randomness here um, does help. And now this is an applied talk, and so I did some computer simulations, and I have a part of an image of a neck, or I think this is from a chin of some MRI image, and then I took, um, I sampled M frequencies from uh, the 2D frequency space uh, in various ways. I just retained only the M lowest frequencies, frequencies lying within a, a radius of the origin, um, I sampled frequencies uh, proportional to one over their Euclidean distance from the, from the origin, one over their Euclidean distance squared, and along equispaced radial lines in frequency space. And then I reconstructed um, an image using as the image of minimal total variation, agreeing with those measurements. And these are the, the, the reconstructions that I get. And um, the, this is the one supported by our theory. So this is, um, this would be the restricted isometry property uh, constraints. And we get a pretty good reconstruction of the original image. Um, this is a sort of a band-limited approximation. And um, it's not surprising that sort of the high order information is lost. And we just get a smoothed out sort of reconstruction. Um, we don't get the fine details are lost. And this reconstruction is, is, is pretty good. And uh, this is a very popular sampling scheme in MRI imaging that is actually used. It's called the propeller. <laughs> and, and so in MRI, they do sample uh, frequency space along equispaced uh, radial lines. And it's probably worth to note that on average, the local sampling density um, for this uh, equispace radial line sampling is equal to the um, 1 over squared distance from the origin, which is what the theory says. So in some sense, the engineers already knew best, and um, they, in some sense, might be getting close to an optimal sampling scheme while still um, sampling within the constraints of the MRI technology. But... Um, perhaps there are, um, probably by add adding some random jitter to the directions of the sampling, um, one could do better. But that's, that's another story. Okay. So that was the first half of the talk. And now I just want to give a sketch of the proof of this theorem. Okay, so the proof uses a few key lemmas. Uh, the first one, which is uh, a result by Cohen, DeVore, Petrushev, and Zhu from 1999, um, 
which is um, um, that if we look at the bivariate Haar wavelet coefficients of a function on the the function a function on the square of bounded variation. Um, so if we look at the Haar wavelet coefficients and we look at their decreasing rearrangement, then the magnitude of the kth largest wavelet coefficient will be um, less than or equal to the total variation divided by k. There's a universal constant here I'm hiding. What this means is that the, the sequence is, is a weak L1 sequence. Okay? And it's actually an infinite dimensional result, but I'm just stating the result for, for in the discrete setting. Okay. Um, another lemma that we use is this is a sort of a, a little trick that's used a lot in compressed sensing is we take uh, the vector C, um, any vector, and now it's in decreasing rearrangement, so we group it into blocks of size S. Uh, C, S0 is just consists, is the S sparse vector consisting of the, the largest S entries in magnitude. So I'm assuming that it's ordered in decreasing rearrangement, so then simply that is just this S sparse vector. C S1 is the S sparse vector consisting of the next S largest entries and so on. And then we can bound the L2 norm of the J plus first block by 1 over square root of S times the L1 norm of the J block. Okay? And this just follows because each entry here is less than or equal to the, um, in magnitude, is less than or equal to the average of the magnitudes here. Okay, so it's a simple but, but powerful little, little trick. And then we recall that our assumption is that our sensing matrix um, composed with the inverse uh, bivariate Haar matrix has the restricted isometry property, so it acts as a near isometry on S sparse. So I take, um, I take these three ingredients together, and then I say, um, so we suppose, sorry, the Haar transform is orthonormal, so it's um, conjugate transpose equals its inverse. So we have this matrix, and it has the restricted isometry property of order 2s, that's our assumption. And so we suppose that x is some image in the null space of A. Okay, so we suppose Ax equals 0. Then we take the wavelet transform of x, and we um, order the coefficients, and then we put them into, into these s sparse blocks. And we note that a, that x being in the null space of a, uh, is just the same thing as saying that c is in the null space of um, c, c up here. And so now we just do a sequence of, of, of inequalities. Um, we use the inverse triangle inequality. And so then we, using the inverse triangle inequality, we can, um, and the fact that um, we have C, C, C is equal to zero, um, we have this, and now this quantity we can bound below. Um, using the fact that this is a matrix that's a near isometry on this 2s sparse vector and on each of these s sparse vectors. So we can really just use the restricted isometry property. And then this, can, this is a sum of all blocks starting at the second block, but using the block trick, we can bound that um, we can say that that's greater than or equal to the L1, the sum of L1 norms of all blocks starting at j equals 1. And then we have this divided by square root of s factor from the block trick. And then using that, this is the tail of the Haar coefficients, and we know that this is in weak L1. Um, I mean, it's, there was a little... Um, technical part about saying it's okay to assume this is a mean zero, but that's not anything. So then we can say that the sum of the tail then is at most uh, the total variation of x times an additional factor of log 
n squared over s. And so this is something that's less than or equal to zero, so just rearranging, uh, rearranging gives that um, the L2 norm of the S largest Haar wavelet coefficients can be bounded by the total variation of X times log N over square root of S. And then using again that the, the remainder of the um, sequence, um, the sum of the squares of all of the remaining entries um, cannot be too large because it's a weak L1 sequence, then we can also bound the L2 norm of the tail and then put that together and the fact that the hard transform is an isometry and we get the desired sub-11 equality. Then. So there are various other things that I could say, um, such as um, all of these um, inequalities I talked about can be extended to higher dimensional signals where the total variation is now um, acting in three directions or four. So three directions, so that corresponds to movies, say, not just images, but movies, which are sparse in three-dimensional total variation um, or three-dimensional gradient. Um, but they don't extend to one-dimensional signals. Um, because the corresponding Sobel of inequality for one-dimensional signals without a variation doesn't scale correctly when we look at the discrete version. And so I, although numerically it seems to hold, uh, there are no results uh, for one-dimensional signals. And everything that I, I talked about is also robust with respect to noisy measurements. So this, uh, for all the results I showed, I could have instead considered um, measurements y equals ax um, plus a noise vector. And then the results would all have a second, uh, all of the error bounds would have an extra term that scaled like epsilon. Um, okay, so I said uh, what happens in dimension one uh, is an open question. And then um, I think, but I am not 100% sure, but I'm 99% sure that the uh, in a, so of inequalities that I stated for um, Gaussian random matrices are sharp up to factor of log n, but they might, that might be necessary, the, the, the factor of log n. I, maybe one of you guys can answer that. Um, at least the result for Fourier uh, measurements is not sharp, and it had four log factors. And then, of course, if you're very ambitious, then you can try constructing deterministic constructions of uh, subspaces satisfying these inequalities or determinist the constructions of RIP matrices. Um, but warning, this is, this is hard and many people have tried. So that's it, thanks. Oh, I don't, oh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Yes. Yes. What would have happened if you had used either the first one block and everything else or the first three blocks and everything else? Well, if I had used three blocks and everything else, it would have been fine, but then I would have had to assume the restricted isometry property of order 3s instead of 2s, so it's a little weaker. And if I had just kept the first block, then down here, when I shift over all the blocks by one, when I go from um, this L2 blockwise tail to the L1, um, uh, then, well, I wouldn't have been able to do that because then if I shifted over by one, I'd have to come eat up S0 over here. So this had to start at S2. Mm-hmm. 
That's a good question. Um, yes, it's, that's the only convex um, convex relaxation that, like, you can't take L greater than one and get these results. And for L less than one, um, well, then it's no longer convex and it's not clear what happens. But there are many other different reconstruction algorithms. At least, there are many other reconstruction algorithms when you have one-dimensional signals. You can use greedy. There are greedy algorithms for reconstruction. Um, there are some um, iterative thresholding algorithms. When you um, go to the, the two-dimensional setting, when you have the, like the um, zero curl constraints that you have to incorporate, then I don't know of anything else, actually. Yes? Uh, so do we, when you're constructing these statistics, it's going to be an HQ randomly subsampling uh, for any HQ or something like that? Yes. Uh, how well does that work if you have something that's not, say, uh, an ensemble statistic? You can have something that's, say, not even So there's an extension. Um, so instead of just subsampling a Fourier matrix, you can subsample any orthonormal matrix with uniformly bounded um, entry-wise um, entries. So like Fourier or there's not really Hadamard. Uh, um, but there's also a, a slight general, or a generalization to um, tight frames um, if the redundancy is not too much, like you have three times as many columns as rows. But not, not much else. I mean, these are very specialized. 